This is Eric from Minnesota. I'm Gord from Calgary and we just enjoyed a energy conference here in Calgary which included the petroleum industry and nuclear power which is pretty unusual for Calgary, Alberta. Energy disruptors. <laughs> so this is kind of our post-mortem wrap-up because we're both interested in nuclear communications and Eric I think is kind of an expert on this. While the messaging of a lot of the speakers was different than I expected, um, I think it was valuable to get people from the, the fossil fuel bubble and a few people from the renewable bubble and a few people from the nuclear bubble to kind of commingle a little bit. I only saw Terrestrial Energy's VIP breakout. Look at the per capita energy use. It's about 90 megawatt hours per year per person. And I did not see your VIP breakout. Rita, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a bit about GAIN because I think it's probably one of the most important initiatives that the Department of Energy has, has undertaken in the last 20 years. The only thing that we both experienced together was the forum. These technologies have been really well proven over decades of experience. People are like, well, why wasn't this commercialized before? There was so much inertia, especially in the nuclear industry. and There was really no motivation to implement a lot of these advanced technologies, even though they were really well proven. Four proponents of nuclear energy, and then the moderator whose name you'll remember. Michael Liebreich. Posing some pretty challenging questions. You know, Bin Laden was a construction magnet. You know, so he, doesn't, he doesn't care how heavy the thing is. Two-day conference, then we got 35 minutes for advanced nuclear. <laughs> Rita Barronwall runs a Department of Energy program called GAIN. And you got Simon Irish from Terrestrial Energy, Caroline Cochran from Oklo Inc., and then myself, Generation Atomic. I got my start into nuclear after hearing the story of what is possible with some of these advanced designs. So not only providing low-cost electricity for communities around the world, uh, but also doing things like desalinating water on a, on a scale we have not done before. And I gotta say, I, I spent the first day uh, doing interviews with anyone who'd sit down in front of the camera, and not one of them objected to nuclear uh, out of principle, right? Mm -hmm. No one had really strong feelings about it. I think they were all kind of eager to learn. Most First Nation are very proactive, very pro-business, looking for opportunities. And we like to look at things that maybe can create opportunities for the future. That, I believe, could be one of them. I can't see where it could be detrimental to the growth of our economy. Opinions or impressions that people have go back a long way to when the technology was a lot different than it is now, a lot less mature. The oil and gas industry and the nuclear industry don't see eye to eye. You are in the middle of fossil fuel territory. To so switch over to nuclear is gonna be a real, real tough sell. But I believe that they can integrate together. I would certainly consume nuclear energy if the risks are addressed and if the costs are managed. Um, because it is one of the sources of clean energy. Nuclear energy, I think it would, it's definitely an option that should be looked at. If there's one industry that is more hated than oil and gas by climate activists, it seems to be nuclear. Right? There's no logic there. Michael's take on it, I'm not sure that's representative of Calgary in general. I think most people are just interested to hear what's good about it, what's bad about it. Mm -hmm. And I think the impression is it's expensive, mm -hmm. not that it's scary. Do you favor nuclear energy as part of the solution to climate change? It gets associated with nuclear bombs or the problem of what do you do with the waste materials at the end. But I think it's absolutely vital as a bridging technology because it has no carbon emissions and, and we need that. Uh, do you agree we're going to need a large expansion of the use of nuclear energy? I think it's a technology that um, we were scared off of by things that happened a long time ago. Um, a technology changes what was true in any industry 50 years ago is probably not true today um, in reality. Uh, so we need to, to be looking with open eyes. Michael's characterization probably comes from his uh, position within mainstream climate community, the renewable energy community. You know, he, he goes to conferences and speaks at conferences all the time, ones where the only time that nuclear is mentioned is the butt of a joke, you know? And it's, it's never the benefits in thinking, well, how, how can we fix the, the economic case? Why is it actually taking so long? Is there a, yeah. a hard physical reason? Generally, what's out there right now is light water reactor technology, where water is the primary coolant. Advanced technologies are looking at different types of coolants. Because you're using those different types 
types of coolants, you are operating at lower pressures in some cases. You have a smaller footprint, fewer uh, folks that you need to operate the plant, enhance safety, lower cost, and higher energy density in some of these technologies. What we did get was a well-regarded panel. You know, anecdotally, a lot of people enjoyed watching it. They don't have to make a bomb, that's not the issue. A dirty bomb will work just fine if you've got uh, radioactive material in the thing, no? I mean, well, why, why, tell me why I shouldn't be slightly nervous. Trying to make a dirty bomb out of it. This would be a really hard target to go after. So there's hospitals all over the entire country and every single one of them has radioactive sources. And this thing that's encased in a really thick concrete that's underground that weighs 70 tons and is also radioactive. When you make it a hard enough target, then it basically makes a lot of other targets much more interesting. I'm much more concerned about biological weapons, chemical weapons, and other things that are much easier to get a hold of and to transport. But also, if you were to somehow get all, through all of that, you have what's essentially a solid block of metal. And even if you had a really big bomb, it wouldn't really pulverize in the way that traditional ceramic fields do. There's a lot of different factors in which make this um, basically impossible. We're kind, of, we're kind of falling into the trap that often nuclear advocates fall into, which is just over-explaining how safe it is. We do that so much that it actually freaks people out a little bit. When we're talking about hypothetical situations that are so far-fetched, they're basically impossible. Like, that's not how terrorism works anymore. It's somebody renting a truck and driving it through a, a, a crowded parade or something, or, uh, or getting a gun in a crowded movie theater, uh, because that's way easier than what Caroline's described. It'd probably be easier for you know, zombie bin Laden to build a plane and then crash it into something than uh, hijack a, a tiny nuclear yeah. reactor. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Simon or Rita, do you want to come in on this on the safety issue? The only people that would really be targeting nuclear, and this has historically been proven true, are anti-nuclear activists. Michael Schellenberger articulated that wonderfully on a CNN debate. <laughs> yeah. Bill Gates, President Obama, Jeffrey Sachs, Richard Branson, Paul Allen, Nathan Mervold, the world's leading climate scientists all saying we need nuclear energy. The response that they've gotten is just rejection out of hand. Do you have any idea yeah. how tempting to target the uh, fuel rods, spent fuel rods are around all these nuclear so, plants? Ralph, well, there was an attack actually on a nuclear yeah. power plant with a bazooka. It was by Greens in Germany. I, I remember sitting there just looking at the clock and seeing it tick down and thinking, how long are we gonna talk about terrorism? Yeah. Back in the 80s, an EBR2 was a reactor at, in Idaho that was much larger than ours, at least in terms of thermal output. But they actually had this thing at full power and just shut it off, shut off all the cooling, and just to see what would happen. The interesting thing is this metallic fuel, it heats up, it expands, and that expansion is enough to shut down the reaction. And then they actually went on to do more tests later that day. And even that same year, that research reactor actually had a higher capacity factor of producing electricity than the fleet at the time. There's also consuming waste and being more efficient with the fuel that you use. If you look behind the veil, if you look behind the market, and if you look at the national lab level, the last 60 years there's been a tremendous amount of work on alternative reactor technologies. Many of them were invented at the same time as the light water reactor which we use today, but they've never been commercialized. They never went across the fence, they never made it to the market. And when you look at those technologies, you realize that, hang on, this is not a question of technical viability. This is simply a commercialize them, do the engineering, the licensing, to put them in a commercial setting. Our reactor system is a molten salt reactor, so very, very different compared to the commercial systems that we've seen in the market for the last 50, 60 years. Nuclear is very safe. It's the safest energy source we know, but you can't argue the safety point like an actuary. You have the same issues surrounding childhood vaccination. You can't argue the point with a concerned mother. Nuclear safety excellence comes at a tremendous commercial price. Your regulator is telling you what you need to do to make it safe. The current product, the current light water reactor, the price of making those safe, the price is commercial irrelevance. They're too expensive. Our safety is based on an entirely different set of mechanisms. It's based on the use of a liquid fuel, a molten salt, completely different technology, completely different system. This is a system where if you lose pumps, you lose power, everyone leaves, what happens next? Nothing. It just sits quietly in the corner. Okay, and that's, that is not the type of profile you'll see with a conventional reactor system that use water. 
So this is a system that has not just a different commercial profile, but a different social profile too. 400 megawatt thermal, 190 megawatt electrical. It's small and it's modular. The intention is to manufacture the components, the modules in a factory setting, uh, and assemble them on site. Our home projects, our, our central project is in, is in Canada. Uh, we, we are taking our system first through the Canadian the CNSC. We're engaging with different countries, but we're mostly engaging right now with the NRC in the United States, the regulatory body in the United States. The way the regulations have been set up are for very large light water reactors where they have huge construction times, huge construction projects, billions of dollars, right? To us, this is everything and we're going to make it happen come hell or high water. We're the only non-light water reactor that's actually engaged with the NRC, um, and we've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, but I think some more will, will come. Um, we see ourselves as kind of the tip of the spear. There is a pretty big difference actually between Canada and the United yeah. States as far as approval levels. The United States typically is between 60 and 70 percent approval of nuclear in general. And then when you go to advanced nuclear where you have these inherent safety characteristics and other things, the approval goes higher. Like Rita was saying, it's one of those unique things that at least in the United States government is bipartisan. So both Democrats and Republicans care about advanced nuclear for different reasons. One usually the left more so because of climate change and, and the environment and then the right because of energy stability and national security. So like in the United States it's a, a remarkably different situation than like Ontario is the highest of Canada. It's like 40 percent approval. Quebec is like 10. If we stopped producing airplanes because early airplanes had a propensity to crash like that would be ridiculous and people still haven't learned about the advances that have happened in the last honestly like 60 years. I got my start into nuclear after hearing the story of what is possible with some of these advanced designs. So not only providing low-cost electricity for communities around the world, uh, but also doing things like desalinating water on a, on a scale we have not done before. Uh, things like manufacturing carbon neutral synthetic fuels using uh, high temperature steam and electrolysis. I think we'll come back to some of those sort of use cases. Let's spend a bit of time on the difference between, you know, I, I've characterized it as your grandfather's nuclear, and I don't think that we should be disrespectful because right now, as we speak, it's producing more zero carbon electricity than anything else, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. In, in North America, in Europe, uh, nuclear energy is the largest source of uh, carbon-free power. Uh, if you go worldwide, it's number two, because there's, there's obviously a lot of hydro out there. Hydro, um, yeah. Yeah. And with wind and solar catching up fast, etc., let's take that as red. He did not bring up then the decreasing value as it's deployed. The decrease in no. value was not brought up? No, no. Okay. And I brought it up uh, later that day in the one-on-one -on -one session right. and said, look, I, I have a graph from Leon Hirth, who is not a supporter of nuclear, and he's a German economist, and he does not like nuclear. And he's saying, once you get to this level of market penetration, the value of each additional watt you add is half of what it was when you started. Electricity is just not needed at that time. It's more expensive to transmit it and deal with that extra power, to store it if you can. The value proposition does not uh, continue well, the more solar you add, and he should know that. The people who argue for all renewables think that, well, if we can go from 0% to 10% to 20% renewable, then we're on the way and then it will get easier and we'll get 100%. Well, it's actually, if you look at the engineering, it's actually the opposite. When you get to 20 or 30%, then it gets harder, not easier, because of the intermittency of the renewables. We're going to make a choice in Alberta soon about how we lower our carbon footprint. We have a pretty significant one. I like to point out that Germany is maybe not a good example to follow because they've deployed a lot of solar and wind, they spent a lot of money doing it, and they have been locked at the same carbon intensity for years now. The big reason that people like you and I are so interested in nuclear power is the massive potential for clean energy it's, it's almost on a completely different scale from anything else that anyone is looking at. There is no scalability challenge with nuclear power. Even today's reactors, you could mine enough for uranium to fuel them and there's no fuel scarcity. Even with very slow minor improvements to nuclear power, I just cannot see a world where there's a shortage of nuclear fuel. It's no. just a question of deploying reactors and how inexpensively you can deploy and operate reactors. My name is Caroline Cocker and I am the co-founder of Oklo Inc. What we're trying to do is a small, very small nuclear reactor to power remote areas. Uh, so when I say very small, I mean 
between one and two megawatts. What we're looking at is in Alaska potentially saving them over 50% of what they're currently paying or they're being subsidized to pay. Um, uh, and it's a similar situation in the Northern Territories after we've done probably about between 10 and 20 units. We anticipate that we can get down below seven cents a kilowatt hour. We found a terrestrial energy five years ago and our reactor system is a molten salt reactor. And our key commercial claim, the reason we're doing this project is because it can deliver $50 a megawatt hour. So that's five cents a kilowatt hour. How many do you need to build to get there? Because I mean, the first one presumably is, um, is, is yeah. more expensive. N equals 10. So by the 10th system, we think we'll be getting close to, to $50 a megawatt hour. But we're not looking to deploy one system every year or, or a few systems every decade. We believe the market opportunity of this technology is hundreds of deployments a decade. You know, the, the, the great refrain from where I used to come from is that the, the solution to low energy prices is low energy prices. It creates, it creates its own demand. You know, one of the things they, they pick up as they're, they're testing the sands and whether or not it's economic to, to pull them up, one of the things they, they get a reading on is how many gammas they're seeing. And like a lot of parts of the world where you have oil, there is also uranium up in the soil. Probably a lot of people in Alberta, uh, when they think about what's up north, they think of it as a treasure chest that uh, they just haven't found the right key for yet. But, but they're thinking of, thinking of the hydrocarbons. People don't have the same perception of uranium because it hasn't been demonstrated on such a scale. Saudi Arabia talking about getting nuclear power so they don't, they don't have to consume their own natural resources and they can sell them as export. No. Uh, I think that's appropriate for Alberta. I mean, whenever we're burning natural gas, just to produce heat. Yeah, the more that you're not using domestically, the more you can sell to the, the world market. For all you drug dealers out there, <laughs> you don't use your own product. <laughs> we know that the current fleet, especially since it's been deployed already, most of the carbon footprint of nuclear power is in the construction of the containment vessel. It's not in operation. So we basically have carbon-free energy with the existing fleet in Canada and the United States. So why do you talk to people about advanced nuclear? Mm. One is that it's super inspiring to me so it's easier for me to to communicate it with passion and for that to show through but the the reasons that it is so inspiring to me is because it it doesn't just a decarbonize the electricity sector or current gen nuclear that's pretty much all you got for a variety of reasons uh, but the advanced designs because of the higher temperature allow us to actually attack the rest of the the problem of climate change so that's nice. It also makes it much easier to talk about the safety case if you have to, to even talk about nuclear waste. It's just a more inspiring proposition uh, to say this new technology, this new innovation, rather than saying, you know that thing that you already have formed your opinion about? Well, your opinion is wrong. Or, or your lack of interest yeah. was a mistake. <laughs> you should really have taken a stronger interest in this thing. Right. In general, it was, it was great to see people so curious about about the technology and really not knowing a lot about it yet but being comfortable with that and being curious to just learn learn more and see how it applies to their uh, their current uh, issue area and what they're working on uh, you don't always see that if we can move towards abundant clean energy we're going to find ourselves doing a whole bunch of things that we read about as science fiction and the difference is just going to be that the energy behind it is inexpensive it's been a barrier to so many technologies and inexpensive clean energy is going to just change everything in the same way that the microchip has changed everything since transistors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> High five. <laughs>